there. The person you're calling isn't picking up. There's any number of reasons why they're not answering, but sometimes your mind goes to the dark place and you decide they've blocked your number. When you block a number, you no longer receive calls or texts from that number. iPhones take it a step even further by including FaceTime. So how can you tell if you've been blocked? Well, there isn't any kind of official notification, but you can make an educated guess by reading some tells. Your first tell is the radio silence. Calls and texts are going unanswered. It looks like the texts are getting received, but no reply. What gives? Huh? Well, if your number is blocked, those texts aren't getting delivered and those calls aren't ringing on the other end. Another big tell? The number of rings you hear before going to voicemail. If all you're hearing is a single ring before being directed to voicemail, then you've been blocked. An unusual number of rings doesn't mean anything particular, but if you're only getting the one, then voicemail, you've been blocked. Another tell, if you receive an automated message after making the call. It's not an absolute, but if you get a call along the lines of the customer you're trying to reach is unavailable, then there's a good chance you're never going to get through. There's other reasons you might be getting this message, but if you're getting this message every day, Good morning. So I hope you've come ready to uh, get into God's Word today. You know, our desire through this series, through every message in this series, is we, we want you to be able to connect with God. We want you as you're praying, as you're communicating with God, you're pouring your heart out to Him. You know, there's things in our lives that are so meaningful and so important to us, and there's seasons that we go through, and we need God more than anything. And, and there's nothing more frustrating in our prayer life than when we're pouring our heart out to God and we feel like He just can't hear us. And so our desire today is that we would be able to reveal unpack some, some biblical truths to you that is going to help you to remove that block so that you have full access for God to be able to hear your prayers. How many of you guys want that? You want God to hear your prayers. Amen? Okay. So, so today, it's, I'm just going to warn you that um, if, you, if you have come with the attitude or the mindset that this is going to be comfortable, it is not going to be comfortable. This is not going to be a comfortable. And here's why. Because Praise God, you have pastors that love you. You have pastors that, that are not afraid to preach the truth of God's word. And God's word can make us very uncomfortable at times. In fact, every time I read it, it makes me feel very uncomfortable because it deals with the me that I don't like. And so um, as we dig into these things, I want you to get excited that the Holy Spirit is talking to you and he's challenging us and stretching us to become more like him because the blessings on the other side are more than you could ever possibly imagine. And so we're going to dig in today to this, this series this is part two of this series, Blocked, and the name of today's message is Praying to the Wrong God. There's times when we feel like praying, we, we feel like he's not answering us. Maybe it's not because um, our prayers just aren't being heard. Maybe it's because we are praying them to a totally different God altogether. Maybe there are gods that we have allowed into our life our lives, that have taken that first seat, that have taken the throne of our heart, that have taken the, the throne seat in our mind. I want to ask you a question. What do you spend most of your time thinking about? What do you spend most of your time meditating on? That is your God. What do you wake up thinking about? When you're driving and there's nothing else to think about, what are you constantly thinking about? What is it that just drives you? What is it that consumes your mind? Because whatever has consumed your mind is controlling your life. And whatever is controlling your life has become your God. Man, that's tough to swallow, but it's so true. And it's happened to me so many times in my life where God has spoken to me and said, Hey, 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 that's not me. That, that's not, you, you've allowed another God into your life to sit in the seat that I belong in. I want to tell you a story of something that happened to me. And in order to really understand and appreciate this story, you have to understand kind of my, uh, the type of person that I was growing up. I've always, maybe you're not like me, but I've always loved money. <laughs> I have always loved making money. There's an entrepreneurial spirit in our family, and I got it. And, and, and from selling lemonade as a kid on the corner to when I was to where I was 14 years old, and I was doing presentations, sales presentations in my basement, 14 years old. And I, I had to have my parents co-sign so I could start a business uh, when, I was, when I was 15. And that, 
that business grew. And here I found myself at the age of 20. I had moved to Jefferson City, Missouri to expand. I was on this global team within the company. And it was booming like crazy. And I got to the point I was making so much money that I, was, I became so arrogant that I found myself saying, why, I'm sitting here 20 years old, why should I go to college if I'm making two, three, four times the money that a professor would be making and they're going to tell me how to make money and how to be successful? How stupid was that? How arrogant I had become because of my, my chasing after success and my love for the things of life. But, you know, I had dreams. I had goals. I had things I wanted to do. I wanted to build big houses and and drive nice cars and trucks, and I wanted to travel. I wanted to be able to go wherever I wanted to go, whenever I wanted to go there. I didn't want any limits to my life. I wanted my dreams to come to pass, and I knew the only way to do that was to chase after money. I had to have lots and lots and lots of money, so being successful financially is all I could think about. But then something happened. I gave my life to Christ. And so in the early stages of my relationship with God, it was going really good. Man, I was was drawing close to him. I was learning more about him. We were starting to develop a relationship, and I loved it. But there was still something down deep inside of me that wasn't right. The closer I'm trying to get to God, I'm still holding on to money with my other hand. And I find myself even praying, God, Okay, so I'm realizing now as I'm reading the scriptures that you own everything and you have a lot of money. So, Lord, I kind of want to be a millionaire. I kind of want to have a whole lot of money. And, and, and in my mind, I'm saying, God, I'm going to tithe. I, I, I'm going I'm to I'm send out missionaries. I'm going to feed lots of orphanages overseas. Man, I'm going to do so many things, God, with this money, but I need you to make me a millionaire. I had myself convinced this is the path. This is, this is an awesome God. I love this God. He has all the money. This is a good God. And so one night I found myself uh, praying with some friends. We had developed this incredible tradition. Every Friday night, me and the boys, we would go out and we would just pray. And into the middle of the night, we would just pray and just seek God's face. And we were growing and we were chasing after God with everything in our hearts and I remember, like it was yesterday, I was laying on my back, and I was looking up at the stars, and this had never happened to me, and it, quite frankly, it really freaked me out. But I'm laying on my back, and I'm looking up at the sky, the night sky, and all of a sudden, I see a, a, like a video starts playing. As clearly as I see you, I saw this, this picture, this video picture, and it starts playing, and here's what, here's what the movie was. It was nighttime. And I was at this grave site, and there was a big, deep hole. And on the other side of that hole was a big, huge pile of fresh dirt. And behind me was like a bonfire flame. And I could see the flickering light that was, the light was shining upon this, this grave site. But I wasn't allowed to turn and look at the light because my eyes were fixed on what was in front of me. It's really important to remember. In the pile of dirt was a golden shovel, much like this one. The only difference being there was a dollar sign engraved in the bevel of the shovel, and it was plunged in that fresh pile of dirt. And I'm sitting here staring at this scene, and it, probably, it felt like probably 10 minutes. I didn't get it. I'm like, God, obviously you're... You're speaking to me like you've never spoke to me before, God. You're talking to me. You're trying to tell me something. What are you trying to tell me? And he said, the, the flame behind you is my presence. I'm with you. And the light that you have tonight to work by is the light of my presence. The hole is where you've been digging. That's your grave. And the shovel that's in the dirt is your God. The shovel in the dirt is your love for money. It's the God of greed. And man, have you been chasing it. Man, have you made that your God. And you've been digging your own grave with your God. Now, there's more to this story. But I'm not going to tell you right now. 
I'm going to tell you at the end of the message. Don't you just hate that? Just pause the movie like you lose the power. You can't hear the rest of the story. Well, this morning, this is kind of heavy. We get it. You guys are kind of quiet. Last service, we were like, this is so hard to preach to a crowd yeah. that's just silent. You go out in the parking lot, make your way to the office, and like, that was awesome. <laughs> that was, I so needed to hear that. I'm like, well, you didn't say anything during the service. I didn't yeah. know. <laughs> thought it was horrible. You were so quiet. I thought, I apparently heavy. am the worst pastor We in the get world. it. <laughs> All right. It's heavy. So just be prepared. It's a little bit heavy, but heavy listen. Heavy but good. Heavy but good. You need to have an open heart and an open mind. Are we praying to the wrong God? We're in part two. We're going to pick up Brad's story, the vision God gave him at the end. So this morning, if you have your word, go with me. We're going to go to 1 Kings chapter 18. And in this story, we're looking at the children of Israel who literally did the same thing Brad was doing. They were praying to a different God, but expecting an answer. Now, They didn't realize it, all right? And so most of us sitting here as well, we're thinking to ourselves, like, that is totally not me. Like, I mean, I'm saying, hey, God, I'm praying to you, but sometimes we're actually deceived. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, we see the children of Israel, and they're going through this drought of three and a half years. So a drought's what? There's no rain, okay? So no rain for three and a half years. Their crops have started to die Their livestock have started to die. People are actually starting to die because there's no vegetation and everything was based upon the need for rain in that culture. All right, so for three and a half years, this is happening. And God raises up this prophet named Elijah. Now, Elijah was one of the most the most powerful men of God that ever lived. And so during this time, King Ahab is the king. He was the most wicked king that ever ruled the nation of Israel, okay? He married a girl. You may have heard of her before. Her name was Jezebel. You ever heard of anybody named Jezebel? Do you ever called anybody Jezebel? You know what I'm saying? Like, we have all these thoughts about this girl named Jezebel being like this worst girl ever, and she probably was. But she led Ahab down this this path away from the one true God, And Ahab then led the nation of Israel, all of the millions of people, away from worshiping the one true God, the God who delivered them out of Egypt, the God who had sustained them in the wilderness, the God who had always been there for them, the God who had done miracle after miracle after miracle for these people. He leads them away from this, all right? And so they've been praying. They've been asking God for rain because everything is dying, and God's just not listening, They're just completely being blocked. Every day they're praying, nothing's happening. We're going to pick up this story in verse 17. And at this point, God has told Elijah, after three years, I want you to go find King Ahab, and I want you to tell him it's about to rain. God is about to show up and show off. Verse 17. It says, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, you troublemaker of Israel? Now pause. Ahab hates Elijah with everything inside of him. Why? Because he blames Elijah for the drought. Okay. Now, if you're the king, who do you think everybody's looking to for some answers? The king, right? But the king is saying, my hands are tied. Like I'm not God. I can't bring the rain. The God of Baal, they believed was the God of rain. So they had been praying and praying and praying that the God of Baal would bring the rain. Okay. Obviously they're praying to the wrong God, but they're sincerely believing that something's going to happen. So when Elijah shows up, King Ahab is ticked. Now, I love it. This is like a total out in the street showdown, okay? This is a this is Elijah now. He answers and he says, I haven't brought any trouble on Israel, but you and your father's house, now we're going to go there, okay? You are the one who walked away from the commandments of the Lord and you started following Baal. Now, This is what he tells him to do. You go and you get the entire nation of Israel. We're talking millions of people. You go gather everybody up. You get the 400 prophets of Baal, the 450 prophets of Baal, the 400 prophets of Asherah who'd been eating at the king's table, and you tell everybody to go to Mount Carmel because that's where they had been doing sacrifices to the God of Baal. Follow me? Okay, so they go there, and Elijah shows up, and this is what he says. He says, listen. God is sick and tired of what's happening right now. And he says this. Let me turn the page. I want to read it verbatim. It says this in verse 21. Now, Elijah came to all the people. Everybody standing on Mount Carmel. And he says, how long will you falter between two opinions? Say two opinions. How long are you going to be divided? How long are you going to falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. 
Elijah at this moment is saying basically this. You need to make up your mind. You've for far too long been trying to hold on to God with one hand and the God of Baal with the other. The fact is you can only focus on one thing at a time. And your focus has completely switched off of the one true God and onto Baal. It's time that you make up your mind who is really God. And here's what God was saying. All I've ever wanted was a relationship with you. That's all I ever wanted. Now, it's kind of like this. Here's an easy illustration. So if I was to take my dirty car, I've got a truck right now out there. If I were to take my truck and go into town and I really need to wash it, but I'm seriously not going to do it in this outfit because I don't want to get dirty. So I just pull up to the bay and I just walk up to a random guy I don't even know. And I say, hey, buddy, would you mind washing my car for me? I mean, I don't even have any money, but will you just go ahead and do it for me? More than likely, he's going to look at me like I have four eyes and be like, I don't know who you are, lady. You're weird. But if I call Brad, who I've been married to for 18 years. And I say, hey, the truck in the parking lot I'm supposed to be driving looks like trash. Would you take that thing over to the car wash, wash it, scrub it, wax it, bring it home with a full tank of gas, and do it with your debit card? You know what he's going to say? You apparently don't have a good relationship. He's going to say yes. He's going to say, I'm sorry, the car's dirty. I'll go take it. Let I'm, me clean I'm it up. I'm going to say, do you want spotless rinse? Exactly. Do you want the tri-coat? What kind of polish do you exactly. want on it? Exactly. We're Come not on, baby. even kidding. Come Brad's on, baby. dad used to own a car wash. Okay, Brad is all about because washing up the car. whatever happens during the day pays off at night. Uh, there you go. Okay. So he's going to say yes. Why? Because it's about oh, yeah. relationship. Listen. Jeez. Just ignore him. Okay. If my cell phone rings, I've told you guys a million times, I don't like talking on the phone. I don't. I really hate it. Okay? Texting was the best thing that ever happened. But when this thing rings, if Brad's picture pops up and I know it's him, I'm going to answer. If one of my boys' picture pops up, I'm going to answer, even though I know they're just asking for money. And feel like, what do you want? Where do you want to go? How much do you need? You know what I'm saying? If one of my daughters, I got their pictures on there. If one of my girlies is calling me, I'm going to drop whatever I'm doing, and I'm going to take their call. Why? Because we have a relationship. And even if I get a FaceTime call at the worst time of the day, which always happens, and it's one of my two little nephews, and all they want to tell me is something that doesn't even really matter in my world, but to them it's really important, I'm going to swipe that. And I'm going to say, hey, Kifton, what are you doing? And he's going to say, Missy, I just got a bottle cap. I named him Big Mac. And I'm going to be like, that's amazing. Talk to Brad. You know what I'm saying? That's life, okay? What's up, buddy? What are you doing? Do we not? And then he just talks and talks and talks until you say, call Blake and Mia. Tell him about your bottle cap. Here is what I want you to understand, guys. Relationship trumps everything. It's about relationship. If you have a relationship with me and you need something, you call me up for a favor, I'm going to help you out. Why? Because we have a relationship. And what God was trying to show the children of Israel is all I ever wanted was a relationship. But see, you want a relationship with no commitment. You want me in your back pocket, and when you need me, you want to pull me out and say, bring the rain, but you don't want to have any daily conversation with me. And God had had it. All right? God had absolutely had had it. So he says, we're going to have a showdown. So they all get up on Mount Carmel and Elijah says, here's the rules to the game. We're both going to take two bulls. You can have one. I'm going to have one. We're going to cut these dudes up. We're going to prepare them. And whatever God is really God is going to rain down fire from heaven. Okay. And they're like, okay, we're into this. And so they cut it up, they throw it on and the prophets of Baal and Asherah begin to pray. They prayed from morning until noon and nothing happens. Complete silence. Okay. And at this point, I love Elijah because he's a bit of a smart like, Okay. And so he's standing back and now he's like, Hey, what's, what's wrong guys? I mean, maybe, maybe your God is just taking a nap. You know what I'm saying? Maybe, maybe he's gone on a trip or maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he'll listen to you here in a little bit. And so they start getting kind of freaked out, a little bit panicky. So they start raising the elevation of their voice. The Bible says they start crying out. And the Bible says they start crying and screaming. And then they go as far as to start cutting themselves to try to show their dedication to this God that they're begging for the fire to fall down from heaven. And of course, nothing happens. Now, Elijah is like, okay, boys and girls, enough is enough. Your time is up. So he goes over and he rebuilds the altar 
Because it says that the altar of the Lord obviously had not been used in quite some time. It had fallen apart. He rebuilds the altar. He puts his own bull up there. He prepares it. And then he prays this very simple prayer, which is very interesting. And you don't want to miss this. It wasn't about the most eloquent words. He wasn't screaming. He wasn't crying. He wasn't cutting himself. He had a relationship with God. He knew who he was talking to. He knew what God's heart was. He knew that God was more than able to rain down fire from heaven and show everybody who he really was. He was going to show up. He was going to show off. Check this out. This is what he does. And he's a smart aleck. I just love it. Verse 32. Then the stones he built an altar with in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar large enough for two sea seeds. So he digs this huge trench all the way around. And then he says, fill four water pots with water and pour it over the sacrifice and the wood. We all know what happens when wood gets wet. It's really hard to catch fire, right? So here's what he's doing. He's saying, fill it one time, do it a second, do it a third until the water literally ran over the trench. Elijah was going to show these guys, listen, There's not going to be any coincidence who is really God because it was dry. And everybody knows sparks can happen when it's very, very dry. He was like, we're going to wet this sucker down and you're going to watch the fire lick it up. And that's how you're going to know that there's one true God. And it's not the dude you've been praying to. Look at verse 36. And it came to pass at that time at the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near to the Lord. And he says this, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Whose nation was this? The nation of Israel. He is literally reminding them who they are and who God is in this prayer. Okay? A lot of times we need to be reminded. We've strayed away. He says, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant, and that I have done all of these things at your word. He's basically saying, everything you've asked me to do, Lord, I've done it, okay? Verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me that these people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Now, let's just pause in the story. This whole time for three and a half years, God had been trying to teach them a lesson, a very, very hard lesson. And sometimes it takes us, allow, it takes God allowing us to go through a very difficult time for him to get our attention. It takes him allowing us to make some mistakes in order for us to get our attention. Now, one of my boys, I'm going to tell on him a little bit, okay? So one of our boys here recently, a few months back, he was wanting a new cell phone, okay? And we all know Brad talks about, I want an iPhone, I want an iPhone, I want an iPhone. Well, in our house, they got their first one paid for by us. After that, it's all on them, okay? They're all teenagers now. Well, he was like, I'm sick of this six plus I've got. I need like an X or whatever the new thing is. I'm like, good, buy it, dude. Like, I'm not paying for it. And so he finds this eight plus, okay? Kind of like this one. He finds this eight plus. And I just kind of laid down some rules. And I said, listen, do what you want, but you have Verizon. That's your carrier, okay? You're going to need a Verizon phone or it's going to need to be unlocked. He's like, I know, mom. I know, mom. I know, mom. Because... Teenagers know everything, okay? And so I'm like, whatever. So he says, hey, will you take me to meet this dude? I found one on Marketplace. My kids live on Marketplace. And so it's like, I found one. Will you take me? And I said, hey, did you make sure it was unlocked? Yes, mom. I don't know why you treat me like a little kid. Like, I know this stuff. I'm like, okay, let's go. You got your money? Yep, 350 bucks, okay? I don't care who you are. That's a lot of money, all right? So we drive him over, Brad and I, and he gets there, and he's like, are you getting out with me? I'm like, no, I'm not getting out with you. You got this. This is your deal. Go take your money and go buy your phone. So he goes over. He gets the phone. He gets in the car. He's so stoked about this new 8 Plus, okay? We get home. He takes out his little SD card, and he pops it in the phone, and guess what happens? It doesn't work. You know why? Because it wasn't really unlocked. And it was a Sprint carrier, okay? So now this is, and all of a sudden, like, you know, part of me, the mom, wants to rescue him. Because I'm thinking, I am not going to be able to get a hold of my kid. Like, or I'm going to let him walk through this bad thing that just happened and just let him learn a really tough lesson. So it's now been five months, okay, since one of our sons had a phone he could actually make a call on. Why? Because he couldn't get it to work. So he calls up Sprint. He calls up everybody, Verizon, every dealer in the area, and everybody tells him the same thing. Like, 
I'm sorry. <laughs> it's just not going to work. You know, he tried all these things. So just this week, he comes back to me and he says, hey, mom, do you think you could help me find like maybe like a seven or something I could get cheap? And I said, yes. Do you know what kind of phone we need to look for? A Verizon Unlocked, right? I'm like, yes. He finds one. I order it two days later. Comes from Amazon. Don't we love Amazon? Comes in the mail. He pops in the SD card. And guess what happens? Hey, mom, my phone works. Five months. He goes without having a working phone. Why? Because I wanted him to learn a tough lesson. Bet he never does that again. Know what I'm saying? Sometimes God will allow you to go through these valleys. He'll allow you to go through those moments in your life where he says, look, you need to learn a really tough lesson. That's what was happening with the children of Israel. You, you think Baal is God? You've made him first in your life? Go ahead. I'm going to let you go for three and a half years. I'm going to let you nearly die. And when you feel like there's nowhere else you can go and you're rock bottom and you're looking up, you're going to begin to realize who the one true God is. And that's what was happening right here in this story. Pick it back up at 38. It says this, Then the fire fell from the Lord, and it consumed the burnt sacrifice. It consumed the wood and the stones and the dust, and it even it licked up the water that was all the way around that trench. And then all the people saw it, and I love this. Then they fell on their faces, and they said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. God. God showed up. He showed off. And the people, thank God, recognized that three and a half years of their life had been totally and completely wasted praying to the wrong thing. Our kids came up with a rule uh, that anytime we tell stories involving them, we have to pay them 20 bucks, <clears throat> which we never agreed to for the record. I'm not paying 20 Because bucks. if we did that, we would, I mean, broke isn't even the word. It would just... Uh, so it's good. Being pastors, you get to share these stories, and uh, they give us a lot of good material. Um, what's, what's it going to take in, in your life and in my life for us to fall on our face and cry out, God, you're God. And, and God, forgive me, because I, I know that I, I've allowed this thing in my life to, con- even as a believer, I've allowed this thing to just consume me, and I've just made this the very center, the very focal point of my life, so much to the point to where I have set this thing on a pedestal, on a throne in my heart and in my mind. I have made this number one, and God's saying, I don't want any competition. I won't do it. I created you. I formed you in your mother's womb. I have always loved you. I love you now. I I will always love you. But I won't, I won't compete with anything else or anyone else. I want to be your number one. I want you to give me your very, very, very best each and every day. And know this, that if you do, I will bless. Do you know that your Father in heaven wants to bless you? He loves you. He's your daddy. He's Abba Father. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you good gifts from up above, but he has to, uh, we operate on his terms. You see, we want to put God in a box. We want to operate by our own ground rules, but we're playing in his ball field. God has a way of doing things, and he's saying, I'm not going to change my way of doing things to accommodate your comfort zone and the things that you like and the things that you desire. I want to sit on the throne, and I have a way of doing things, and either you're going to play my way or you're going to play your way, but the choice is yours. The choice is yours. What are you going to allow to consume your mind and control your life and be your God? So the rest of my story. I'm sitting here staring at this site. The shovel is in the dirt. There's a grave in front of the pile of dirt. And I have made this money, my God. And the Lord says, you have a choice to make. Now remember in the the vision, I couldn't turn around and see the fire because my eyes were fixed on the shovel. That's what my eyes were fixed on. I had made the God of greed my God. I had made money my God. And you can't look to both gods. You have to choose the God that you've put on the throne or the one and only true God in your heart. You can't look at both. You can only look at one. Scripture says that you can't serve both masters. You can't serve money and you can't serve God. You're going to have to pick one or the other. So in the dream, God says... 
here's the choice you need to make. If you want me to be your God and you want me to bless your life. And remember, this was at a turning point in my life where God was calling me into ministry. It was that year that he was calling me to spend the rest of my life for him. And I had a choice to make. Which God was I going to pray to? Because, because I had made money number one in my life, every time I'm sending these prayers, I'm praying to the God of greed. And God can't hear me. So I was up against a, a roadblock in my prayers regarding my future and regarding God's promises, and God couldn't hear me. Not because he didn't want to hear me, but because I wasn't allowing him to hear me because I was praying to another God. I was praying to the thing that I had made most important in my life. He said, if you want me to be God, then you're going to have to put that God to death. He said, take the shovel and put that shovel in the grave and bury that sucker alive. Kill it now. Execute that God of greed. And in my mind, he showed me throwing that shovel in the grave and he said, now look at your hands. And I looked at my hands and he said, these hands I gave you to be lifted up, to exalt my name, to worship me, to express your love for me. When we, when we hold our hands up in worship, this is a sign of surrender saying, God, I am nothing and you are everything. That's why we worship with our hands lifted high because we are drawing all of attention, all of our praise, all of our adoration, all of our affection, everything, God, we give to you. We surrender. We can't do this on our own, God. We are nothing. You are everything, God. We believe that you are the answer to every problem that we have, God. It's all you. He said, take those hands that I gave you. You're wired to worship me. I gave you hands to worship me. Take those hands and just begin to push that dirt over the top of that shovel and just fill that grave up with the hands I gave you to worship the one and only true God. And that night, I'm telling you, something shifted and something changed in my prayer life like I've never seen. I put that God to death. There's lots of gods that compete for, number one, for the number one seed in our lives. I want to read this passage of Scripture to you. Found in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. It says, but you, when you follow your own wrong inclinations, your lives will produce these evil results. These are the gods, impure thoughts. Think about things that you think about. Things that you allow to, to consume your mind will control your life. Eagerness for lustful pleasures, pornography, idolatry, anything you put before God whatsoever, spiritism. This is encouraging the activity of demons. Hatred, fighting, jealousy, anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself. Just being completely selfish. It's all about you complaining, criticism, the feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own little group, envy, murder, getting drunk, wild parties, and all that sort of thing. Let me tell you again, listen to this part of the scripture, as I have before, that anyone, anyone living that sort of life, anyone that has made one of these gods the God of their life, that person, that sort of person or life will not inherit the kingdom of God. Why? Because He's not your God. You've allowed something else to rule and reign in your life. And the prayers that you're sending out aren't even getting to him. They're getting to that thing that you have made most important. So here's my question for you. When is enough going to be enough? When are you going to be sick and tired of allowing these false gods to wiggle their way into the top slot priority position of your life? When are you going to take whatever that God is and say, you have no right to work your way into my life. You have, you have no right to sit on the throne of my heart. You are going to die today. When are you going to get sick and tired of being sick and tired? And take that shovel of pornography and throw it in the pit. When are you going to take that shovel of envy where you've been caught in the curse of comparison over and over and over? You can't stop thinking about the type of car your neighbor drives or the type of house they built or that you're not making enough money. When are you going to take that God of constant complaining 
where you're praying to this God, it's never enough. You're the God of never enough. You're the God of never. Nothing is right. Nothing is ever going right. You are the God. When the one and only true God is the God of more than enough. He's more than you could ever ask for, imagine, or even think. And he wants to rule and reign in your heart. He has everything that you will ever need. But yet we want to make that God of never enough, the God of our life. Haven't you noticed yet that the more you pray to that false God, he's not answering you? You can put that thing first in your life all you want, and it's not going to get any better. He's not going to answer you. He's not going to bring you comfort when you need comfort. He's not going to bring you peace. He doesn't have joy for you. He has nothing for you. It's all about him. When are you going to put him to death? When are you going to put jealousy and anger down in that grave? When are you going to take these things, toss them in the pit, and use the hands that God has given you to worship him and push that dirt over the top of your grave. Hmm. Isaiah 59 and verse 2 says, It's your sins that have cut you off from God. Because of your sins, he has turned away and will not listen anymore. Listen, it's not because God doesn't love you. God told me in that dream, he said, Hey, the more you dig yourself, the, the more you put the God of greed before me, you're digging your grave deeper and deeper and deeper, and you're going to dig it so deep eventually that the light of my presence that's behind you, that fire, is no longer going to be upon you. You are going to bury yourself. You know that false God that wants to make his, his way on the throne of your heart? He wants to kill you. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to get you in that grave so he can bury you alive. Who's going to bury you? God is saying, stop digging. Stop digging. Because you are separating yourself from me. Not because I don't love you. But because this is your choice. This is something that you're doing on your own accord. You're making your own grave. Listen to what Joshua said. I love Joshua. Chapter 24 and verse 15. Man, he had had enough. And he says to the people of Israel, he says, Choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell right now. But as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. We are going to serve the living God. When are you going to make that proclamation, that declaration over your home? When are you going to get such a holy anger that you say, I am done with this. I am so sick of this. As for me and my house, we are not going to serve these false gods. We are going to serve the living God, and we are going to serve him alone. He is the one and only true God. Just like the children of Israel, they fell on their faces, and they cried out. They said, Lord, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And when you do that, you want to know what's going to happen. There's going to be a breakthrough of that barrier, that blocked barrier. There's going to be a breakthrough, and God is going to be able to hear your cry. He's going to begin to hear your prayers because now you're praying to the right God. And what I love about this story, it's so awesome. This story, you've got to read this whole story. today. I challenge you today, it won't take you 10, 15 minutes. Read this chapter. Read it slow and let God speak to your heart because what happens next, unbelievable. Elijah kicks all the tails, takes all the names, just wipes them out. And then he says to his servant, they're on the mountain, on Mount Carmel. And he says to his servant, he says, hey, he says, go walk over the peak. I want you to look into the sky and tell me what you see. What had it not done for three and a half years? How many months is three and a half years? 42. If you haven't been in, if you weren't here last week, you got to listen to last week's message. If you weren't here for the 42 series, you got to listen. He says to his servant, go and tell me what you see. And he says, master, I don't see anything. He says, all right, come back. He's messing with him. He says, all right, go back again. Tell me what you see. And he does it. He does it two times, then three times, then four times, five times, six times, and then a seventh time. He says, all right, I'm done messing with you. What do you see? He said, master, I see a rain cloud the size of a man's hand. 
Seven times. How many months are in seven years? Eighty-four. And what did we learn last week? You know, there's going to be a time in your moment of breakthrough, God's going to send the rain. His promise is going to come to pass when you make him the God of your life. When you make him the most important thing, it is going to rain. God is going to pour out his promises like you have never seen, but he has to be your number one. You have to give him your very, very best, and he will bless. It rained. And you know what he said to a servant? I love this part. He said, hey, make your way down the mountain. Hurry up before the rain beats you. It's going to rain. Look at somebody and say, it's going to rain. Yeah, that was pathetic. Look at somebody else and say, it's going to rain. It is going to rain when we make him the one and only true God. Let's pray today. Father, we love you so much. And we just, right now, God, we, we, we know, Lord, that as, as the message went forth today, God, I know, I know you. And I know that you are the God of fire. And I know that there's so many of us, God, we are living in the dark and we are worshiping these gods in the dark. We're digging our own grave with the gods that we've served. But your light, God, the light of your fire, the light of your flame has exposed these things. You show us what we're doing in the dark. That's your Holy Spirit. So right now, God, I pray, as many people in this room and those that are watching online, they're they're seeing these gods that you have exposed in the dark. So Lord, I just challenge each and every one of us in this place to identify who that God is that we've placed before you in our lives and that we would put that God to death, that we would bury that God alive right now. That we would use the hands that you've given us to worship you and we would push that dirt over the top of that grave and bury that God alive. And that we would fall on our face and we would say, you are God. And look at the flame that was behind us. Turn around and put our focus on the fire, the God of fire, and say, Lord, you are the one who answers. You are the one. You are the one true God. And we thank you now, God, that as we do that, we know that you're going to fulfill your promises in our life. You'll take us from one season to the next, and you will send the rain. With heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're in this place, And you say, Pastor, I don't know Jesus as my personal Savior. I want to give you the opportunity right now to admit in your heart, like all of us in this room, that you're a sinner and you need a Savior. His name is Jesus. Believe that he is the Son of God. Confess him to be Lord of your life and live for him beginning today. If you want to do that, I want to know who I'm praying for this week. Would you raise your hand in this place? If you're watching online, would you type in the comment section below? I'm all in. You do that today, and we are praying for you. But church, as as a church, let's pray this prayer together. Father, I love you. you. Thank you for Jesus. He is the Son of God. God. Please forgive me of my sins. I make Jesus Lord of my life. life. Help me to put my focus on you, God. Help me to put put these gods to death. death. And declare you to be the one one true true God. God. Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, if you just prayed that prayer, we want to celebrate with you by giving you a gift. This is called our Next Step Kit. It's in a green bag on the left as you exit. Pick one up. It has a brand new Bible and a message from Brad and I that's going to help you to know how you can be successful in this journey of living for Jesus. And I want to tell you right now, guys, just very, very practically, how do you know if God is number one? Let me just ask you a very simple question. Do you make his word a priority each and every day? When you wake up in the morning is the first thing you grab your phone so you can check social media to see what happened overnight or do you hit your Bible app and do you put him first? A lot of times we think, oh, that message didn't apply to me, but I challenge you to ask yourself, what is number one? Will you put your hands together for all of those today who just prayed that prayer? Hey, thanks for joining us today. We sincerely hope the message impacted your life. Stay connected with us by following us online, or you can find us on Facebook. If you would like to partner with us financially, we have a few easy ways to give. You can text your giving to 77977 and simply type in MMC and follow the prompts. 
or you could find us online at www.mountainmoverschurch.org and click the Give Now tab. Or you could simply mail your giving in to 24000 South 660 Road, Grove, Oklahoma 74344. We are a church leading people into a real and life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ that is contagious. We look forward to seeing you next week.